This is a Peugeot 5008, and it's a bit like an espresso coffee. You see, it's essentially just instant coffee. However, it's way cooler and more desirable. And that's the same thing with this car. You see, it's essentially a seven-seater MPV, but no one wants one of those. They're not cool. So they've dressed it up in an SUV body, and it's instantly more desirable. So in this video, I'm going to tell you whether this is a car that you can buy with your heart as well as your head. To do that, I'm going to talk you around the design inside and out. You can see how practical it is. You can take it for a drive and I'll point out some of the things that are really good about it and the things that really aren't so good about it. Now, I'm Matt Watson. This is CarWow. I hope you all enjoy the video. Buying a new car? Then head to CarWow and my team will help you find your next car at a fair price. CarWow, your one-stop car buying comparison site. Peugeot has made some changes to this car's design as part of a midlife refresh. Quite hard to spot though. You have to either be a complete Peugeot anorak or a motoring journalist. So you've got some new rear tail lights. They're actually LEDs now and you have scrolling indicators. Look, it's all very Audi. You've got some new bumper designs and, wait a minute, some horrendous fake exhaust pipes. These are awful. <laughs> what is the point of those? That is a change that isn't for the better. There's some new alloy wheel designs. Wheel sizes start at 17 inches. These are the 18 inches. Still a little bit too small. Thankfully, you can get 19s, though they may affect the comfort when you're driving over bumps. Down the side, this car is it's pretty long, isn't it? Though Peugeot's done a good job of disguising the length somewhat, make it look a bit more interesting by adding lots of shiny roof bars, you've got shiny bits around the windows, shiny bits down here, and the whole like glass area like tapers towards the back, which sort of gives it a sporty-ish look. Now, here at the front, this is the best angle of the 5008. They've actually changed the front slightly, so it looks even more aggressive than before. You've got some new LED headlights, and now this bit, look, this fang it's a daytime running light which comes out of the headlights so i don't know why they actually call it a fang because that would be its eyes see the fangs from anyway <laughs> enough of that not so sure about this bit it's kind of black panels which are supposed to look like vents and clearly aren't vents it does look better than before this is what the old car looked like i prefer this new one this is the gt model so it has a slightly different grille than models lower down the range it's quite nice isn't it the outside the best bit though of this car the inside, let's check it out. Peugeot does great interiors. They're so interesting. I mean, look at the design of this, the way you've got these different layers, the inlays, all very nice. The material quality is good as well. So squidgy and squidgy, even squidgy here. It's only when you reach really low down do things get scratchy, but I can forgive the car for that. And generally quality is good as well. Look at this. I can shake the entire car and this center console doesn't move. Though I have found one thing that I'm not so keen on, and it's this bit of trim just doesn't quite fit properly. And if I own this car, that will do my head in no end. I and mean, there's something else that might do your head in about this car. It's the way that Peugeot has this small steering wheel and then the dials above it. Depending on how you sit, it can mean that the steering wheel's rim can block the dials, which is terrible. For me, it's fine for how I like to sit because I have the steering wheel quite low. Look, so I have it quite low. So that's good for me. But if you're thinking about buying this car, you have to get behind the wheel and see if this layout works for you because it could be a big no-no. Now, as part of the midlife updates, Peugeot has introduced some new trims for these inlays here and here. You can also get some different seat fabrics and a red leather interior. <laughs> this is what it looks like. Would you have that? Maybe not. Peugeot has also updated this car's infotainment screens. The entry-level car gets an 8-inch system. Every other one gets this 10-incher, and it's a nice big display. The colour's a little bit on the dark side, and obviously it's a touchscreen. You can swipe through things pretty easily. But handily, there's some shortcut buttons down here, which are like piano keys. I really like them. Moving on to the digital driver's display, same as on the old version, no changes to that at all. It's actually pretty good. You can cycle through different menus and views. It's all very simple and easy to use. Well, so long as you can see, that's the steering wheel, that is. As for in-car storage, it's all right. Look, underneath here, you've got a big cubby. Plenty of space there, with a little tray as well. You've got a couple of cup holders there. There, There is a problem with these cup holders. If you have a small cup in there, no issue. If you have a larger cup in there, look at this. I now want to rest my arm in my cup of coffee. Hmm. There's another tray there where you can put your car's keys 
And look, there's the obligatory place for your mobile phone there. This one's got the wireless charging facility. Oh, good. So too with the door bins, look. Big bottle. Fits easy. In fact, you can fit more bottles in there. You can go crazy, fill it up with loads and loads of bottles. Generally quite a practical interior. Nice. Let's check out the back. That's what matters most, isn't it? It's a family car, the seven seater. Knee room, that's good. Headroom, that's good too. Now, if you have the panoramic glass roof, which is really nice for making it feel lighter in here, it massively eats into headspace. And then for someone over six foot, they are gonna struggle for headroom. Another thing that I'm not so keen on is this. Look, the front seats, they're quite low down, so you can't stretch out underneath them, though there's still quite a lot of foot space. And you'll probably notice, look, the floor is completely flat which is brilliant if you're carrying three people in the middle row at once because it means there's loads of room for everyone's feet. And because you've got individual chairs, look, and they all slide and, come on, where's the tab? I know you're there somewhere. Where are you? Come on. There it is. <laughs> look, they recline as well. It's quite easy to get comfy. And it's quite a wide body, so even with three adults, there is just about enough shoulder room here. Because there's so much room back here, you don't really have to push this front passenger seat forward to fit in one of those bulky rear-facing seats. Some like practical features such as nettage, tableage on this one, blindage, and these back windows are nice and big, so kids will get a good view out. There's two USB ports there, and if you're wondering about the middle seat passenger, what they're gonna to do to charge their phone, don't worry, there's also an old fashioned 12 volt socket. Big news about this car though is of course, that it is a seven seater, so let's check out those very back seats. What I'm gonna do first though, is put this seat, yeah, yeah about that, look. Okay, knee room for me. Will I fit into the back? I'm also going to just lower these ones so you can actually see what the heck is going on. All right, let's lower this. I'm going to climb in this way as well so I don't move that seat. Because I want to do the test of knee room here in the back. So that was fine for me. Can I cope with knee room like that? That's okay. And even if I sit up dead straight, I've just about got enough headroom. So adults can cope back here. You won't want to go too far but more than adequate for children. I like the fact that the rear windows are okay. This is actually quite a decent seven seater in the very back seats. Now I'll show you how you operate the, the seat when you actually get in and out, it's like that, and it has memory, so it'll slide back to where you left it. You actually slide the seat like that. So yeah, it's quite easy to get in and out of the back. Let's check out the boot. So one of the great things about the 5008, apart from the fact it has loads of space for carrying stuff. It's dead easy to do that thing where you fold down all the seats, look. It's just super simple. Very, very well thought out, as he does it wrong. <laughs> it's my fault, not the car. There we go, look how easy it is to get rid of those rearmost seats. And then, if I want to put the other ones up, fold it down, and then you just flip the backs down, like that. Once you've folded all the seats down and put those covers in place, you've got a completely flat floor, so it's dead easy to load, and there's no load lip either, so you can just slide things straight in. There's also some handy tether points here. A 12 volt socket up there. The only problem with this car, I think, is this, look. When you put these rearmost ones into position, you can see how easy it is. You then have a very small little boot area. I mean, it's tiny, less than 200 litres. If you want to carry seven people at once and have a bit more actual boot space, a Skoda Kodiak is slightly better. Now, if you'd like to see my full in-depth video review of the Skoda Kodiak, I'll put a little link up there, that pop-up button, you just click on it. You can go check it out if you want to, or there's a link in the description. But that does bring me on to five annoying things about the Peugeot 5008. The buttons for the cruise control are on a little stalk behind the steering wheel and you can never see it, so you don't know what you're pressing. And it's awfully close as well to the gear selector and the indicator, so you sometimes knock that when you're fiddling around with the cruise control. And to make matters worse, the button for the lane keeping assist is all the way over here. Why isn't it over here with the rest of the cruise control? It's all just badly thought out, really. There's a huge gap between the slow cover and the seat backs, which means that your valuables aren't completely shielded from prying eyes. Depending on how you like to sit, the design of these seat bases can be a bit annoying because there's this ridge at the back of them. So if you push your bum all the way back, it pushes against that, and then it's always like just digging in your ass. Picnic tables you get on range topping models. On that sturdy, watch this. Oh dear, no. it means that if your child has a tantrum, look, ah! 
their food is going to be just all over the floor. As with many Peugeots, the glove box is pointless. Look, it's only that big. It's because there's a load of fuses there, and when they move the steering wheel to the right, for the right-hand drive UK cars, they don't bother moving all these fuses and electrical stuff with it, so we're just left with that space to put our gloves. Don't worry, there's still plenty to like about this car. Here's the car wow, five core features. If you like to smuggle contraband, you'll like this. Look, some extra secret storage underneath the floor. You can fold the back of the front passenger seat down like that. It's good if you want to carry really long items or if you plan to convert this into a limousine. Look, yeah. You can remove these rearmost seats. Look at that. They're not too heavy. They only weigh about 10 kilos each. And then you have some more underfloor storage if you need that rather than the seatage. Peugeot has given this new 5008 its latest auto emergency braking system so you can spot pedestrians and cyclists at speeds between 3 and 86 miles an hour. It also is available with a night vision system which can see 200 meters beyond the range of the normal headlights. The doors extend all the way down over the sill so look how dirty that is there. Doesn't bother me though because when I open the door it's nice and clean so when I get in and out look and I rub my trousers over the sill they don't end up dirty. Engine choices for the 5008 are pretty simple. Range kicks off with a 1.2 litre three cylinder turbo petrol with 131 horsepower. That comes with either a manual or an automatic gearbox. Then there's this 1.6 litre turbo petrol four cylinder with 181 horsepower. That is either manual or automatic. Then there's a 1.5 litre diesel with 131 horsepower and you can get that with a manual gearbox or an automatic gearbox. And then there's a two litre diesel with 177 horsepower and that is automatic only. All cars are front wheel drive. You cannot get it with all wheel drive at all, even though it looks like a sort of off-roader. Which 5008 do I recommend? Well, if you do quite a lot of miles, I would go for the 1.5 litre diesel automatic in this GT specification because it's got plenty of equipment. What I've actually done is configure one of those through CarWow. And if you want to see how much you can save, what the offer is, you can just click on that pop-out banner up there if you want to check it out. Now let's see what this 5008 is like on the motorway. First thing I want to do is check the performance of this engine. So I'm doing 50 miles an hour. I'm going to suddenly overtake before this truck comes. He's let me out so we can go. Yep. Engine and gearbox responded pretty well there, actually. Uh, you would expect so with this 1.6 litre turbo petrol. <laughs> Does all right. I think you're going to need one of the high performing engines if you're going to be doing lots of motorway miles and if you're gonna carry lots of people in the car or luggage as well. This engine though, despite the performance, it does decent economy as long as you tickle it along. So I'm actually averaging 41 miles per gallon. I'll take that. However, if I was gonna be doing lots and lots and lots of motorway miles, I would go for the two litre diesel. It's just a bit more relaxing and you will get even better economy out of that. In terms of the rest of the experience, this is nice. It's comfy, it's reasonably quiet only when you're on a rough surface, do you get a bit of noise from the tires? And if you hit like expansion joints on the motorway, do you get a thump from the suspension? But generally, this is quite a relaxing car to travel long distances in. I'm impressed. Let's see what this 5008 is like on a twisty road. So I can put it into sports mode. You know, that sharpens at the throttle response, adds a bit of weight to the steering. And I can put the gearbox into manual, use the paddles. Pointless. Let's go back into automatic. Let's go into normal because really it makes no difference to how the car performs. <laughs> and it actually performs pretty well. A seven seater SUV that goes around corners very confidently. Wait a minute, I'm a poet and I don't know it. Didn't mean to rhyme, it just happened. It does, it grips the road really well. And this little steering wheel makes it feel sort of like responsive and darty. Surprisingly so. If I'm brutally honest though, the correlation between how much you turn the wheel and the response you get is not quite as precise or as well judged as in something like a Volkswagen Tiguan Allspace. That just seems more linear, a bit more in tune with your brain. So a little bit better for going quicker in, which you don't really care about anyway. But if you do care and you'd like to find out more about that Tiguan, then you can click on the pop-out banner up there if you wanted to go watch my video review of that car. One thing that you might have to worry about though is the gear shift if you get the manual because like the brakes, the gear shift and the clutch are just a bit stodgy. It's like someone's got a load of cookie dough and just shoved it all in the gear selector and it's all like a bit kind of... 
Other than that, though, this car is brilliant in town. It really is. One last thing to try, though. Parking. Road is narrow, so this is going to be hard. Oh, I've got a van behind me. I'm now under pressure. The back window isn't particularly large either. I'm glad I've got the automatic car for this. That turning circle makes it quite easy to slot this thing into tight spaces. I'm impressed with that. Far better than I thought I would. The over the shoulder visibility is actually quite good. That helped. Here comes Van Man now, he's getting cross. Look, here he is. Sorry for holding you up. Bye. So then what's my final verdict on the Peugeot 5008? Should you avoid it? Should you consider it? Should you shortlist it? Or should you just go right ahead and buy it? Well, I reckon you should shortlist the 5008. It's a really good, practical family car. And for a seven seater, it looks pretty good as well. I hope you all enjoyed the video. If you did, please give it a like. If you click on that box there, you can sign up to the CarWow newsletter and we'll keep you up to date with all the latest car news in between these video uploads. Click on those windows for more content. Thanks for watching.